Well, good morning. I just wanted to warm up our minds a little bit, and I wondered if you could sit back and watch this video. You're welcome, and I'm sorry all at the same time, but hope that woke you up. Before we jump into our passage this morning, um, I want you to take out your notes and jot down five things that are important to you. Five things that are important to you. So what do you think about all day? What do you live for? If you can write down five things. And we'll be coming back to those a little bit later in the talk. Some examples might be your social life, your spiritual life, family relationships, academic life, your musical endeavors. Give you a couple more seconds for that. Once you're there, you can keep writing, but um, turn to Colossians chapter 1. We'll be starting on verse 15, reading all the way to verse 20. Don't want to rush you on your list. Give you a few more seconds. Okay, Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 15, going to verse 20. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from, all, from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So going back to yesterday, in the midst of a church, that was being bombarded with false teaching that downplayed the powerful and importance of Jesus, Paul is taking us on a journey to see how big, how powerful, how essential and supreme Jesus is above all things that have been created. 
Just like, just like the Christians Paul was writing to, the church and we as individuals are influenced by the surrounding cultures. So we need to know that Jesus is supreme over all things. He is the image of the invisible God in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So all throughout scripture, it's been the consistent teaching of the Bible and the church that God is invisible. God the Father is spirit. In 1 Timothy 1.17, we see it says, To the king of the ages, immortal and invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. In 1 John 4.12, it says, No one has ever seen God. Jesus Christ is the, is the visible image of the invisible God. The visible image of the invisible God. However, Jesus, on the rescue mission we started talking about yesterday, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. We can turn to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Actually, I'll, I will... I do not have it up on the screen. I will read it for you. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, He is the radiance... He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making the purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. So first, he's the radiance of the glories, glory of God. Throughout the Old Testament, you may have seen some of those moments where people saw, people saw aspects of God. Those were called theophanies. That's when someone encountered God, but believe me, they weren't actually looking at God. His radiance and glory is so great that anyone looking at him wouldn't be able to stand what they were seeing. His greatness was that great. And the extent, the exact imprint of his nature. He's not like us. Not like actually is the imprint. We sometimes say, this is like this, or it's similar to this. But God, it wasn't saying that Jesus was similar to God. It's saying Jesus is God. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Interesting, the exact imprint of his nature. So if you've seen Jesus, you've seen God. Let me give you an example. I might have some similarities to my dad, but no one would ever come to me and say, oh, I'm seeing your dad right now. Or the same thing for Griffin. You, wouldn't, you might look at him and say, oh, you look maybe some similarities to your dad, but you wouldn't call Griffin Bill, right? You would look at Griffin and say, oh, maybe he's your son. There's similarities. But Jesus actually is God. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the Father. Also said he's the firstborn over all creation. This isn't referring to, this isn't referring to order, it's referring to rank. So Jesus was not the first person born in the flesh. We know that by reading through the Bible. Um, history has been going on for a long time. But it's rank. He was the firstborn of, according to purpose. In the Old Testament, we always see that the firstborn always receives the priority and the supremacy. And here, Paul is placing Jesus in the first place. So for the rest of our time this morning, I want us to look at five reasons why Paul is giving Jesus first place. So first, everything was created through Jesus and for Jesus. Everything was created through Jesus and for Jesus in verse 16. He is not part of the created world. He is the creator of the created world. Um, everything has been made by him. And Jesus, because he's not created, Jesus is actually one of the members of the Trinity. He's God. He's not a lesser member of the Trinity. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard it said before, but all three members of the Trinity are equal in essence, but distinct in their function. Jesus was born born as a child in the flesh. But that doesn't make him any less of God. Jesus is God. Everything owes their existence, inc including us. Everything owes their existence to Jesus. His handiwork is everywhere you look. I heard a pastor recently say that the made-by tag behind everything that has been created, the mountains, the seas, everything beautiful that we see in the world, they all have a tag that says, made by Jesus. Everything was made by Jesus. Jesus made you. 
Jesus made you exactly the way he wanted you to be. He made us with our talents, our uniqueness, our strengths, and yes, our weaknesses. Jesus made us the way he wants us to be. So the, the way you are right now is on purpose. You are who God created you to be, and that's a good thing. God doesn't make mistakes. Next, Jesus is before all things. We see in verse 17a, Jesus is before all things. This shows us his supremacy in time. He was present before all things. And that's a quality that only God can have. Quality only that God can have. Next, Jesus holds all things together. The world is sustained and upheld by God. More specifically, the whole creation, including us, is upheld by God. Example. Many of you right now on day two at Shehi may feel tired, overwhelmed, you might feel anxious, and especially after this time of camp and all the classes you've been to and all the lessons and all the time you've spent, maybe you didn't sleep that well. You might be feeling overwhelmed, but Jesus will hold you together. The same Jesus that's holding the whole world together will hold you together in this place today. Think about that. Jesus wants to hold you together right now and guide you even when you're tired, even when you're exhausted, even when you're anxious. God wants to do that through Jesus. Next, Jesus is the head of the church. In the Bible, the primary metaphor that we see used to describe the church is a body, right? Has anyone ever heard someone call the church a church body? Good, the church body. So right now we see Paul referring to Jesus as the head. And it's not too difficult to read about the body of Christ being such a vital part um, of how God wants to reach the world. We are the body. We're the body of Christ who's called to reach the world. But the body does not exist without the head. Everything that the body does begins with the head. And Jesus, so Jesus is not just an aspect of God's plan for the church. He is the plan. The body without the head is not living. We need, we need the head. And Jesus is is the head of the church. And that is a powerful metaphor that we need to remember as we think about who he is. Next, Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. And this is alluding to his resurrection. <clears throat> Once again, firstborn is not referring to rank, but it's talking about, it's not referring to chronology, it's referring to rank, his importance that we talked about a few verses ago. So, uh, firstborn among the dead. So there have been others, if you can think of someone like Lazarus, who was raised from the dead by Jesus. But all of the other people who have been raised eventually died. It was a miracle that Jesus did to show people who he was, but it wasn't a permanent thing. With Jesus, his resurrection was a permanent resurrection, and a resurrection that showed us that someday we too will be resurrected in the new heavens and new earth. Jesus is given the rights of the firstborn because of his resurrection from the dead, showing that the world, showing the world once and for all that he's the living son of God, fully God, fully man, the only one able to live, to die, to rise again, and reign over all the earth. Jesus is the firstborn from among the dead. That in everything he might be preeminent or supreme or given first place in all things. So Jesus isn't just one of the important things um, that, we, that we talk about in our lives. He should, he should be the thing that overshadows everything else. Start thinking about your list. He should be the thing that overshadows all other things. He's given first place over all of them. I'm going to move to verse 19. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So after hearing the list of his qualifications, those five qualifications that we just looked at, we see that Jesus is uniquely equipped to make peace between God and mankind. He is the only person that's ever lived that was fully equipped to make peace between God and mankind. Why? First, because of his deity. For God was pleased to have his deity dwell in him. No other person has ever been able to call themselves fully man, fully God, like Jesus was. So his deity fully equips him for this unique role. Second, his saving work. It says, and through him to reconcile himself, everything to himself. All things in creation that have been tainted 
um, his people, the creation around it, all of those things have been reconciled by Jesus Christ. And that his savings work is one of those major things that we see that connects us back to Jesus. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So, to wrap things up here this morning, only God in the flesh is able to come to this earth as God and man to die on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. He alone is worthy of first place. And this passage is showing us that Jesus is everything that we need. It's not Jesus plus one more thing. Remember like some of the world views yesterday? It's Jesus plus one more thing that we need to add. No, it's, it's not Jesus plus anything. It's Jesus plus nothing. Jesus is all that we need for our salvation and for our life and to live our lives. Jesus is everything that you need right now to survive here at camp and to thrive and love and love your time here. Jesus is everything that you need. Now, if you could take back your top five list that we made earlier, if you could pull that out, your top five list of priorities and things that are important to you. So this wasn't a test to find out if Jesus was at the top of your list. This wasn't a trick. But it rather was an opportunity for you to consider how and if Jesus is supreme in each of those areas. Is Jesus supreme in each one of those areas? Looking back at them, Jesus should be a vital part of all five of those things. He should be supreme over all those priorities in your life. So a couple of challenges I have for you this morning. I want to ask you the question, have you invited Jesus to be Lord over your social life, your academic life, your dating life, and your musical endeavors, and whatever else you wrote? Have you invited Jesus to be Lord over those things? That is, for giving him the first place or making him supreme in those areas. It may, might be a qu time to question, do I know Jesus Christ? Do I have that relationship with him? We've talked about God sending Jesus on this earth on a rescue mission to save us from our sins. We can't really talk about our priorities and giving him first place unless you've already have a relationship with him in the first place. So, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, my question for you is, um, do you want to know him? Do you want him to be your Savior? Do you want to um, give him your life? And I would, that would be a great time to talk to your counselor about that today. Or come talk to me at the end of this time together. But if you do know him and you're ready to give him priority, I have a couple more questions for you. Or challenges. It might be time in those areas that you wrote down, it might be time to ask God to reveal idols or God replacements that you've made supreme over him. What are those areas that you've made supreme or given first place over him? It might be time for you to confess and repent for placing those things above God. You can acknowledge that those things are there. God may have pointed those out to you, but unless we we both confess and repent those things to him and turn around and make those changes through the power of his Holy Spirit. Um, it doesn't really matter if you thought of them. You need to do something with that and confess and repent. And for all of us, it's time for us to ask God how to put Jesus first on a daily basis by the power of his Holy Spirit. It's not a one-time thing that we make him first. On a daily basis, we need to talk to the Lord and ask him by his Holy Spirit to give us the power to place him first in all things. It's not easy, right? It's not easy as things are bombarding you and challenges and things that you need relationally and all the things you're trying to learn. It's not easy to give him first place, but that is what God calls us to do as followers of his. Give him first place in all things, and he wants to make all those other things are going to be, all those other things are going to start working, their, working themselves out in, in place of priorities when we put him first. But we need his power to do that. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you this morning humbled by your word, seeing that we are unable to give you the priority in all things, Lord. We're unable to make you supreme in each of the areas of our life. We're unable to do it by our own power, but we know that, Lord, that you can give us the power to do it, Lord. We ask for a filling of your Holy Spirit so that we have the strength and the power to make the decision moment by moment, day by day, to give you the first place in all things, Lord. Lord, we come to you confessing the idols that we've placed in our lives. Those relationships, those endeavors, those um, 
things that we've placed in our lives that we've placed above you, Lord, that, we've, that we think of first, Lord, above you. Lord, I pray that we can, you will convict us and challenge us and help guide us back to a path of placing you first in all things, Lord. We thank you for loving us so much that you're patient with us and have mercy with us on a daily basis. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. In your name, amen.